Attack on Titan's ending is a generational masterpiece. After watching the final episode of Attack on Titan, which left me feeling a little hollow, I knew I needed to talk about this episode as I think it's pretty much a perfect ending, especially for a series like this. From the brilliant action sequences to the cabin scenes, and of course the finale and end credits that just ripped your heart out and made you question the cycle of life and what we are as people itself. Attack on Titan's ending is awesome. So let's talk about the final episode and much more. If you love AOT, Jujutsu Kaisen, Demon Slayer, One Piece, or Chainsaw Man, then this is the place for you. Subscribe and ring the bell or I'll karate chop you in the funny bone. Watch out! We first have to talk about the scene in which Armin and Zeke meet for the first time in the paths. This scene to me is one of the best and most well-written in the episode, mainly because Zeke and Armin discuss their different outlooks on life and humanity. Zeke feels that humans are controlled by fear, and the meaning of life is to simply reproduce, nothing more. This is totally in Zeke's character, as if you'll remember throughout the series, Zeke always supported the idea of euthanasia. That the only way to stop the cycle of hatred that Eldia and Marley have gotten themselves into is to eliminate the initial guilty party who carries these special abilities so that Marley and the world would have no reason to fight over the Titans or kill anyone for that sake. This is because Zeke has always believed that humanity reproduced to simply multiply out of fear of extinction. At the core, this is the very idea of really why anyone fights in AOT, to some degree, to Zeke at least. Grisha fought for the future of his wives and sons. Mikasa fought to protect Eren. Ymir, Fritz fought because she loved King Fritz. It all started to Zeke with this idea of reproduction and fear. Nothing else in life means anything to him or anyone else because of this. So when Armin recalls that time he, Eren, and Mikasa would race to the tree on the hill with him always lagging behind as Mikasa let Eren win the race, Armin realized that at the end of the day, what made him the most happy wasn't that he won the race or anything. It was the fact that he was able to be there for the ride and experience the nice breeze on his skin. See the leaves carried by wind gently flying through the air and of course seeing the two people he loved the most being there for him and he for them. Zeke was missing something important in all of this, something he could never know because Grisha and Dinah starved it from him. It was never about reproducing to become a titan shifter and save Eldia or to enact a euthanasia plan with Yelena. Zeke's mission to save the world from themselves wasn't really what he wanted or held so dear in life. What he held dear is the childhood he desperately wanted. To play catch with his father, to, to be doted on by his mother. Zeke never got to experience the small joys of life that Armin is describing, except for one playing catch with Saver. From Armin's perspective, that leaf is just a leaf, but due to the power of the paths and the dual perceptions it brings with it in its mysterious ways, Zeke is finally able to complete the puzzle. Zeke's leaf is his baseball. All he ever wanted to do was play catch. He could do it all day. He didn't need any of this stuff before him, despite him still ultimately believing in this plan. What he needed was a normal life where he could enjoy ball hang out with his parents, and just be a kid. Zeke is the epitome of, well, mommy and daddy issues in the series, and I think much like anyone else, Zeke is a tragic character that once again fell victim to the Titan curse that Ymir has brought onto the world. However, the scene that I think captured everyone's hearts and souls was the cabin scene. A long time coming, this moment is probably one of the all-time best sequences I've ever seen in anime, period. There is so much depth to the mirroring of past events, constant references, and small details that make this scene so memorable and full of almost endless death. Just as an example before even talking about what the two even said to each other, what we can observe from it is just vast. For example, the fact that it's a cabin is a reference to Mikasa's happiest place in her life, the cabin she was raised by her parents in. So since this is a dreamlike timeline with it being her decision to run away with Eren, she chose what she knew, and that thing that she wanted to return to all this time was her little cabin in the woods away from the hustle and bustle of the walls of paradise. On top of that, the idyllic scene has more nods and references to so many past Mikasa and Eren moments. For one, Mikasa in this scene chose to have her classic hair back. Now, the reason it was cut in the first place isn't stated in the series, but basically she grew her hair out long between the events of season three and four, so she would keep it knotted up or in a ponytail. 
One day, it was accidentally cut, and this is why her hair is now short in the final season. That being said, she prefers this original look because this is what Aaron told her to do. He told her to cut it short, and so in this moment, she never had the chance to get her hair accidentally cut. It's the same for Aaron too, as Isayama, the creator of Attack on Titan, stated the reason Aaron grew his hair out long was because he stopped caring about living, as from birth his entire goal was to activate the rumbling and kill everyone. So there wasn't a reason to care about his appearance anymore, the only thing that mattered above all else was completing his goal and moving forward. However, at the cabin scene, his hair is short. Well, this is because this is the look Mikasa knows Eren for, not the depressed, long-haired, omnicidal man, but the brash young man with short hair. His mother's looks and those big round eyes that just pierce right through you. It also means that Eren, above all else, cares for Mikasa so much that he would go to these links to make sure she experiences this serene and tranquil moment just the way she wanted it. As well, the scene directly mirrors episode 1 as Mikasa and Eren in their Respective episodes are gathering wood while the others sleep, waking up by a nightmare which makes them both cry. As for the actual scene itself beyond just the visual references, it's here that it's put into perspective that Mikasa from the very beginning really always made the right choice. Throughout all of her doubting and worrying in pretty much every season and episode for Eren, always wondering if she was doing her best just for him, throughout every single moment this scene gives vindication for all of Mikasa's actions in the series. She never made a bad decision or compromised herself for Aaron. She always remained independent of him despite always being there to protect him. We know this because in the cabin scene, this is what Mikasa's life would have looked like if she ever confessed her true feelings for Aaron at any point. They would have ran away together and lived out the rest of Aaron's life happy, all the while their friends and family around them would be slaughtered. Marley would wipe out Paradis, gaining total control over the world. Mikasa, was right because she knew the right answer and what it always was to remain strong because her strength was what carried her through the best and the worst she's not a slave to love she's not a slave to Aaron, and she sure as hell is not a slave to anyone we also have to talk about armin and Aaron's chat in the paths because this is the scene that changed the most from manga to anime in fact it's pretty much written entirely differently than in the manga and it has so much more depth to it, which is because the entire episode was rewritten by Isayama himself, in fact. In this scene, Eren basically explains to Armin what he knows about Ymir Fritz. Essentially, she fell in love with King Fritz due to Stockholm Syndrome that has kept her captive. She can never stop loving the man who killed her family, pillaged her home, sentenced her to death, and ultimately the man who would bring her joy by giving her children. The thing she was looking for since she died was a separation from her love from King Fritz. That person, as we've established, needed to be strong and not a slave to love or anyone, and the person to do the separation was Mikasa. So throughout the entirety of the series, as Mikasa has sudden headaches out of nowhere, this was not due to some Ackerman gene as Eren lied to Mikasa about. This was actually due to Ymir Fritz the entire time sifting through her mind for reasons only Ymir Fritz and Mikasa knows. But the one thing Ymir found without a shadow of a doubt is that after 2,000 years, this is the woman to free her and finally let her pass on. This caused Ymir to change her mind from taking out her frustrations and pain by destroying the world that cursed her and that she cursed to finally move on from Fritz and her pain finally rest. Ymir Fritz was the instrument of Attack on Titan. This helped put into perspective for Armin and Eren what truly was going on here. This scene also revealed that from the very beginning, Eren wanted to activate the rumbling no matter what, and it goes so deep that even Eren remembers his first seconds of life as Grisha gives him his name and tells him that he is free. This is somewhat complicated, mostly because this moment is so multifaceted. Eren has the past memories of his father to recall his own birth, but also, as well, he also has the future memories from many different paths he could take into the future due to the Attack Titan's innate ability. So because of these, well, time travel-like aspects, Eren remembers his own birth from his own perspective, and essentially everything he's done and will do in the future as faint feelings from his first seconds of existence. So this is why he felt he needed to go through with this. The attack and founding acting in conjunction with one another basically ruined his mind to the point where past and future held no meaning. It was, in a way, determined by the higher power of 
time itself. The moment the founding and then the attack titan came into existence was the moment Eren's fate was sealed, thousands of years before he even existed. So because of that, Eren feels guilty for what he did and wants to die. Even if Armin feels there is another way, and there clearly is, he definitely could have lived here. However, Eren's guilty conscience, the fact that he both is the mass murderer and also a garden variety idiot, he can't allow himself to live because he is the one who took the lives of, well, 80% of the planet. Due to the Titan's abilities he obtained, it made him go through with the rumbling. But we know for a fact that without those abilities that Eren would just be a normal man living in a world with his, well, freakishly strong, hot, raven-haired, to-be-looking, trauma-having best girl Mikasa. In many ways, Eren is a manifestation of the past and the future and a slave to it. Slave to freedom. But because he knows from all the people living inside of his head that every single one of them weren't free. And the ones in the future probably wouldn't be free either. They were burdened by the Titans, by Ymir, by their governments or whoever. None were ever truly free, and with 2,000 years of history and with an endless vision into the future, he knew he had no other choice than to sacrifice his own existence to the very concept of putting an end to everything. Eren was right the entire time. This was the only way. There was no other way. How could Eren sit back and let this cycle continue when he alone is the one with the power to end it? Still though, Eren is just a normal person at the end of it all, and for that reason, he also regrets what he had become. In an ideal world, he would never have to play this role, to play the king like, say, King Fritz did. The real Eren inside of him, the one we never really got to see until, well, the final scene, shows that his true desire was to live free and really normally with Mikasa and Armin, and that's it. So because of this, if there is a hell, he knows he's going there, and so does Armin. Armin was the very catalyst which gave Eren his dream to explore the world and uncover the vast seas of fire and the verdurous waters of the sea. Armin feels just as guilty, and instead of fighting that feeling of what he's all done, he instead embraces who he is and what he's done. From the guilt he felt after his first kill to the countless lives he took in Liberio, Armin can't forgive himself or justify what he's done as anything good, so he just accepts it. He's just as bad as Eren or anyone else that has taken a life, and for that reason, the two embrace and share a moment where finally, after so many years, they can just be themselves and let go of the pain they've all been through. It's a moment of catharsis for the two, and it's one they deserve as they both acknowledge they can never be innocent, but also realize they are somewhat victims as well. Though I think some of the most important material in this episode is the end credit sequence. Over the years, as Eren has now passed, Mikasa moves on and starts a family of her own as, finally, Paradis is able to industrialize and move into the future. While we don't know for sure, it seems that there is a possibility that she and John married each other and have started a family of their own. This is sweet, as John has always had feelings for Mikasa since season one, but as well, it's nice to know that Mikasa was able to move on and, and not be hung up on Eren, but still remain attached to him and always remember him. Going to his grave when she could, you know, with her family wearing that scarf she would eventually take to her grave. Even in her final moments of life as an older woman, barely able to reach out her hand to put a flower on her grave, assisted by John. She still remembers him and cares deeply for him. As she eventually passes on and time passes, we see that Eren was able to actually stave off war, not just for a measly 50 or so years, but due to his actions, we see Paradis evolve into a futuristic society some 10 to 20,000 years into the future. Eren was successful. He brought peace to the world for so very long to the point that humanity evolved into something not even reminiscent of centuries past. But even still, war takes hold. People often forget what came before and so the world once again destroys itself. Humanity is brought to the brink and Paradis, finally after 20 years, falls to war and fear, like they always do. From the dirt, humanity rose to prominence, built their own imperfect utopia, and then eventually, they returned to mud as they destroyed it all over again. Just as they've done before, and just as they'll always do. But if there is one thing Eren can say he did, is that he brought peace to Paradis for tens of thousands of years. He succeeded in stopping war 
and the cycle of hatred to continue for so long. His plan worked. But even then, after the fall of humanity, a child with a scarf and her dog make their way to the one thing still left standing after all of these countless years. Aaron's burial place. That tree on the hill. Untouched by war, unravaged, and kept pure. This tree has been allowed to grow tall into the sky. The gravestone may be buried somewhere underground, but there within the tree is something. What it is, nobody knows, but what this all symbolizes is that, boiled down to a pure essence, humanity's existence is predicated entirely on the functions of cycles. Love, war, death, greed, famine, hatred, apathy, everything. It's what humans are as people, and that no matter what anyone does, no matter how long peace lasts, eventually humanity will do it all over again, repeating the same mistakes and choices, all in the name of something indescribable and unstoppable, the human condition. Attack on Titan is a story that will never be told again, that nobody will ever be able to capture. It came about at the right time, the right place, and Isayama, through every single moment, wrote a highly complex and deep story. Now, if you were to talk to Isayama, he will tell you he sought to create a simple story. But in execution, it's simply not true. He created a story that brilliantly showed in just 89 episodes what humans are, what they can become and fall prey to, and what they can be. It's a warning to future generations. Attack on Titan's ending is a masterpiece because there is literally no other anime that told a story so unique, so original, so vast and enlightening that I think, without a shadow of a doubt, this series is an instant classic and will be heralded as one of, if not the greatest stories ever told in the medium of anime. There will never be another like it, and I can say that I live to see it in a time where the future seems so uncertain and dark, just like in the series. Attack on Titan gave me hope that there is a future beyond that will bring us to something better, to fight fear and not run from it. Holy Kakarot, Goku. Thank you guys so much for your insane support on my last video. As I write this script, it's sitting at 300,000 views. And by the time you see this, it's probably at like 500K or even more. I've never experienced such a reception to a video ever. And I, I still don't know what to think about it. It feels so, uh, so surreal. Like it's, like it's not even happening. So I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. If you're one of, uh, I don't know what, what, 5,000 people who just subscribed, I, I, I just, wow, thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the channel and my videos. I also want to take a moment to plug my weekly seasonal anime podcast, just, you know, to inform the new people how much stuff I actually do. The King of Anime Podcast. We're currently covering Attack on Titan, Spy Family, Jujutsu Kaisen, Fryrin, Roroni Kenshin, and some older anime too. We also cover weekly news from anime and all around all the entertainment industries. We also do the podcast weekly and we, and we do it live. So if that interests you, then show some love, head on over and subscribe there as well. Well, I have a second channel called Bento, where I cover the newest chapters of Chainsaw Man as they drop. So if you do love Chainsaw Man, which is another series by the same people that created Attack on Titan, this channel is for you. It's a lot of fun analyzing new chapters and seeing your reactions. So maybe head on over and show some love there too. Thanks guys. Financially support the channel by becoming a patron where you'll gain access to my mega One Piece arc reviews and first impressions. Thank you so much for your continued support over the years. I love you all.